spirit and a truth. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, we glorify thy name in all the Father, thank you that we as your family have gathered, sit at your feet, look into your eyes, see your holiness, your blazing purity, your awesome forgiveness and strength, and welcome it into our lives in a fresh and new way, as in a new covenant. Jesus, thank you for the demonstration of the great love of God for us the sacrificial love and witness of great love, forgiveness, and redemption, the forgiveness of sins and resurrection life. And Holy Spirit, thank you. Move among us. Work in our midst. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're accomplishing already. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Move. Keep moving. Keep drawing us in. Keep bringing us into the Word. Keep bringing us towards the Father and the Son. Keep revealing them to us. And may we have your strength to live the life that is worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. In everything we do and say, may you be glorified. And even as we look into your word, and even as we come close to it now, oh, Father, speak to our hearts. Galvanize our strength. Build our faith. 
Give us strength as we move out into this world of darkness as lights shining for the kingdom. Jesus, we want to pray for those in our midst who are sick. Jesus, be healing them. Be healing them, Lord. May your kingdom come into their situation, and may your will be done as it is in heaven, already accomplished. Father, we pray for Bill, who's had 12 surgeries on his knees, on his ankles. Jesus, bring healing. No more surgeries. Bring strength to that ankle. No more pain. Cancer, be gone in the name of Christ. Emotional battles, be gone. May we have the mind of Christ strong and affirming in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Broken down relationships, find healing, find forgiveness, find wholeness, find strength in you. Thank you. We bless you, Lord, for this time. It's been sweet to be in your presence like this. We give you the glory and the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Nursery is now open. So if you have a young one, six months to age four. And I just want to add to that that uh, if you want to during the service if your child is staying with you you can use the mom's room as well which is these two windows you just go down the hallway it's right across from the nursery and uh, you can see in and hear everything and your little one can be in there or sleep or fuss or whatever happening at that moment Uh, and also young people youth age 11 to 17 you are now welcome to join into a brand new class that's happening just for you twice a month every other Sunday, I think it is, in the prayer room. And uh, so uh, that's a good place for it. (laughs) So if you're in that age bracket, you're welcome to go and attend. Anybody that's 11 years old to 17. I believe Pastor Ryan is teaching that one today. We'll put those names and those kids at the foot of the cross as well because they are dear to us. Amen? (laughs) All right. Let's open the scriptures. And if you will, please turn in your Bibles, there's a Bible there near you if you don't have one, to the book of Revelation, and uh, we're going to finish up chapter 19, and we are going to walk through chapter 20 together to be encouraged this morning. So that's chapter 19, and we are going to walk through these passages together. So before we begin our journey, I just want to repeat a couple of things. It's been a couple of weeks. We finished off with a strong hallelujah because we have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb, a great supper that is going to take place. And when we receive that invitation, when we act on that invitation, which is a picture of the gospel, it's a picture of receiving his invitation to life to the wedding feast of the Lamb. That invitation comes with a blessing, as we learned, that are blessed are those who receive this invitation. So receive it. Receive it and walk into the beautiful banquet hall of God when the time comes and be prepared for a great feast to end all feasts, so to speak. <coughs> Excuse me, so to speak. <coughs> That's what was happening. And the celebration was because God has had victory and is having victory and will ultimately be victorious. That's why we're having this wedding feast. The Lamb has come, the great city, the prostitute, Babylon, is fallen. Present tense, is fallen. And even now, it's falling Because God has designed evil to collapse in on itself. The weight of lies and deception and control and manipulation is too much for it to bear. And it says that God purposed that it will collapse in on itself. Amen. That's good. And so we are singing hallelujah because of the victory of God over the dragon 
over the beast from the sea, which is dragon-manipulated politics, the beast from the earth, which is dragon-manipulated religion, also known as the false prophet, trying to control you and manipulate you. He wins. He beats it. He beats over all. He wins over all. And as we have been discovering as we've gone through the book of Revelation, we have been discovering all along that we are reminded faithfully of this wonderful truth. God wins. Jesus wins. And when we come together with him, when we surrender to him, we win too. When we come to the death of ourselves, even as he died, we die. In him, we win. And that is the good news of the book of Revelation and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we've talked about this, but it's going to be essential today. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. And that means that you can't just read it like a book. You have to realize that it is moving in cycles, and it's actually turning and switching. And things that are being talked about at this particular moment may have happened prior to the events that you just read about. And that's how it all works together. And so there's little clues. One is, we're going to read it in just a few moments, but when it says, and I saw something open, heaven opened is a very common way of saying it. Whenever that happens, it's another section. He's moved from one section to a new section. There are five sections, and we're coming to the final section, the fifth section today, because we're going to read those words, and heaven was opened. So what did he see? That's the thing we need to understand that it's not necessarily what happens next in the book of Revelation, it's what does John see next that matters. Because what John sees next may not have happened in sequence. It may have happened prior to. And so you gotta keep your wits about you as you're going through this book. (coughs) Excuse me, it creates a lot of fun actually, especially when you're studying it. And today we're talking about millennium, which is so much fun. Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. All right, Uh, this will now, as I've mentioned, will be the fifth vision, the fifth section of this book. Now, I want you to know, too, again, there's nothing new in the book of Revelation except whenever John walks Old Testament passages through the cross, through what the Lamb has done, every time he does that. Every time he walks an Old Testament passage through what Jesus has done, it changes slightly because Jesus is the fulfillment of that passage. And so especially in, well, we're going to talk about millennium in just a minute, but in the millennium passage, it is rich. It's saturated in Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah, from Psalms, from Ezekiel, from Daniel. It's just saturated. It's almost like, almost word for word, it's coming from somewhere else. As John tries to unpackage this mysterious thing called millennium, the thousand years. All right, let's begin our journey at chapter 19, starting at verse 11. And I saw heaven standing open. When something is open, we look, we see, it opens up to us. And that is the beauty of apocalyptic literature. That's the meaning. Something is opened. Something is revealed. Heaven is revealed. And it's like we get to stand a, a little bit, and, or sorry, see, see behind rather the curtain that is happening all around us. It gives us the eyes that we need of faith to see what God is up to. And there before me was a white horse. White horses always pertain to victory. White horses. The king would ride in on a white horse. Victory. Whose riders called faithful and true. We've heard that name before in chapter 1. He's already been called this. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He is faithful because he is faithful to everything the Father has ever told him to do. He is 100% followed through on God's will. Everything the Father instructed him, he did. He is faithful. And because of that, therefore, he is faithful to us who believe. 
He is faithful. He will be there with you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. He will always be in whatever it is you're in, whatever trouble or trial you're in, he is with you. He is faithful. And he is true. He will speak truth to you when everything else is speaking deception to you. He will speak truth. But not only truth, it means also, that word means not fake. He is not pretend. He's not dangling a carrot out in front of you saying, well, I hope you have a good life. He is true. He is not fake. He's the real deal. He's the full meal deal. He is it. He is the one. He is true. He is genuine. And he loves us. And because of these qualities, with justice, he will judge and make war. He does not mess around. He can see right through you, as it's going to say in just a moment, with eyes like blazing fire. He can pierce through you. You cannot deceive him. You can't pull the wool over his eyes. He sees and knows everything, which is hard to imagine, isn't it? Come on now. Are you with me? It's hard to imagine, but he sees and knows everything about you. Nothing is hidden, the scripture says. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of God. You can't fake it in his presence. He is not fake. You can't fake it. You must be genuine with him. And that's the beauty I think was happening here this morning, is there was some openness, some honesty, some revealing of genuine faith. Amen? He loves genuine faith. As you just watched Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he responded to genuine faith. That's what he was after. All right. His eyes are blazing, as I mentioned, which is pure and purifying. On his, heads are, on his head are many crowns. Interesting in the Greek. This many crowns is like a stack of crowns. Could be as many as a billion Isn't that interesting? On his head, his one head, he has billions of crowns. Now, as I studied this up, I realized there's a couple of clues. One is that we cast all our crowns at his feet. Do you know that passage in the book of Revelation? Which means he takes them from his feet and he puts them on his head. You and I are one of those crowns on the head of the king. Hallelujah. Envision yourself, the majesty, the royalty, the royal priesthood we're called. We are one of those crowns on his perfect head. It's an amazing picture of victory. Every single person who believes, every single one who believes and surrenders puts their crown before him. And he takes it and he puts it on his head. Awesome. I love that vision. He has a name on him that no one knows but himself, of course. We only know, according to Paul, we only know Jesus in his poverty. Think about that for just one second. There are things about Jesus that we can't know yet. But one day, we will see him as he is. Wow! Because now all we see him is in his poverty. And believe me, it's an amazing poverty, isn't it? Righteousness, joy, peace, love, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Faithfulness, yes, faithful and true. All of these things are him, but we know this in his poverty. He gave up, it says in scripture, that he might become a slave. He gave up heaven, he gave up so much so that he could come here and be like one of us who sleeps and eats, and excuse me, but he burped, and he probably passed a little wind. This is our Jesus, a man, God come in human flesh. Truly amazing, truly amazing. All right, we can never know him fully, but we see that he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Interesting, because in the sequence of things here, the war hasn't happened yet. Do you see that? As you keep going, you'll find that the armies come. The armies and the kings all come to fight him. So where did the blood come from? Why is his robe dipped in blood? Whose blood do you think it is? 
his own blood. We'll get to that later. He has a name, I've mentioned that. He's dressed in his robe, dipped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. The powerful Word of God. That goes all the way back to Genesis. And it says in the scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what happened? He spoke. Boom! It happens. Nothing can not happen that when he speaks, it has to happen. Because his word is powerful. And in fact, as you read through this whole story, you begin to realize he shows up, he speaks with the sword of his mouth, and everybody dies. The war's over. That's it. He shows up and speaks, done. This is his power. This is good to fill your mind, fill your soul with these amazing images. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses, victory, and dressed in fine linen, as we heard previously that this was what they were given. The bride was given white linen clothing. So who's in the army? We are. We come. It's his blood that makes us clean. My robes are washed because his blood cleanses me. The blood that is dipped, his robe is dipped in. And so we are in the war. We fight in this war. We're part of the battle. But we win not by our own strength. We win because of the word. His word. And so when we have troubles, we go to his word. How can a young person keep their way pure, it says in Psalm 119, but by taking heed to his word. The word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, which is now going to be coming out of his mouth. Able to discern what is bad attitudes and good attitudes, what is right, what is wrong, what is a bone even and marrow. Truly surgical in its strike. This is his word. This is his logos. Absolute power. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he strikes down the nations. He speaks and it's over. And as we learned in chapter 12, he will rule them with an iron scepter, quoted from Psalm chapter 2, and repeated again now twice in the book of Revelation. You and I must know, we must know in our fabric, in our bones, he will rule and is already ruling. He doesn't become king, he already is. All right, he is already ruling. He treads, present tense, the winepress of the fury, the wrath of God Almighty. We've already been introduced to this in chapter 17. He was treading that winepress and what was coming out? Delicious wine? No, blood. Blood as high as a horse's belly for 200 kilometers. Blood. That means that God's wrath was poured out where? On his son and not you and not me. And he's trampling that. And the blood is flowing. It's spilling up onto his robe. He's trampling that winepress of God's wrath. And his blood is enough for you and for me to be and to find forgiveness and to be forgiven. There's enough blood for everybody. Enough to go around. 200 kilometers as high as a horse's belly. It's kind of a gross image. But it's powerful anyway. Because... That blood, that blood, pure and perfect blood, is the only way a sin can be forgiven. That's the only way. His blood. He himself alone is the only one, the perfect one, who is able to take the wrath of Almighty God over sin and evil and deal with it. He is the Lamb slain as we heard a little bit earlier in one of the chapters from the foundation of the earth. He is the lamb slain. And on his robe and on his thigh, he is a tattoo. King of kings and Lord of lords. He shows up and it's over. Come on, you guys. You're sitting there like you're still sleeping in bed. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. So brilliant 
illumination. And he cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the midair. Birds are always symbolic of evil. He, he prophesied to the birds, come to the great supper of God. What? There are two suppers. There's the wedding feast of the lamb, and then there's another supper. And this one's for the birds, literally. And they are to come, and they are to eat, it says, the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men and horses and riders and flesh of all people, slave and free, great and small. This is Old Testament imagery, and it's all about the destruction that evil does. The birds come and destroy you. Evil destroys. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war uh, against the rider on his horse and his army. But, (laughs) I love that, oh, change the scenery, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. And with these signs, he had deluded those who'd received the mark of the beast and worship his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider, of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. It's interesting to see this in present tense. Because this battle is happening now. It's happening now. And it will come to a final battle eventually. You ready for this? The birds are already eating flesh because they represent evil. And evil is destroying people. It is like a supper that God has already prescribed. A supper that he's inviting the birds to. Take your revenge on this evil. And the reason why he does that, I believe, is because he knows that he can deliver you. He knows that he can win over Satan in your life. For greater is he that is in us, that's Jesus, than he who is in the world, that is Satan. So you need to see this as big, bold pictures that are happening around the globe even as we speak. All right, I think that pretty much covers that section. Paul spoke it this way. All of that, he said in Colossians chapter 2, that Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public, spe- a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. So this is what's happened. He has disarmed them. He has taken away some of their power. Not all, unfortunately, but some. We're going to find that out in just a minute. All right, chapter 20 now. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. Here is an interpretive clue. Whenever John writes in the book of Revelation about seeing angels ascending or descending, he is going back in time. That's helpful. That'll get you sort of, okay, wait, when did this take place? Well, he's going back in time now. So he's going before this battle takes place, before this supper of God takes place, before this one who comes was a rider takes place. This is happening before. Are you following? Okay, you gotta be with me now. You gotta wake up a little, because it helps. All right, so he has two symbols, a key and a great chain. Now, we all know the abyss doesn't have a key, and a great chain can't hold the devil, okay? But what he's given is he's given authority. That's what that means. And he seizes the dragon, the ancient serpent. Just in case there's any mistake, the the ancient serpent, the one who is the devil, or Satan. And he bounds him for a thousand years. Wow. An angel does this. Now, when I sat back and thought in my office, rubbing my chin, wait, why wouldn't Jesus do this? Why why wouldn't the Father do this? Why send an angel? Have you ever wondered that? You have? I did too. I'm sitting there thinking, what could all this mean? Why didn't he deal with it himself? 
Why send an angel? And then I had one of those aha moments as I was studying and reading and all the rest of it preparing. I had an aha moment, and it's this. Satan is an angel. He is a created being. He thinks he is God, but he's not. And you get the impression here that God is saying, I just need to send an angel to take care of this angel. I don't need to go myself. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? I'm just sending an angel. He's got to, I'm giving him authority, give him a chain, give him a key. He's going to bind up the enemy. Wow. And I started to praise God. I started to rejoice in my heart. I started to see something. I started to see that the old devil, he likes to paint himself bigger than he really is. Amen? He likes to make you think that he will never leave you alone. But he can't do that. He's just another angel. A fallen angel? Yes. A powerful angel? Absolutely. But as we're going to find out, what does this binding mean? What does binding devil mean? All right. Well, why don't we just dive in then, since we're already here. First of all, a thousand years. All right. So, as I mentioned, because it's apoc uh, apocalyptic literature, uh, this scene happens prior to the battle scene, prior to the one coming with the faithful and true, the sword and the white horse. It happens before this. So this happens before the end, this thousand years. And, and John is describing two battles, or is he? I had to ask that question too. Because in the first battle, he is, the kings of the earth are all coming. He invites the birds to help themselves, right? And they're all destroyed and thrown into the abyss, right? Well, there's another battle described following this passage. Now, let's look at it briefly here, if I can find it in my notes. I should have put my reference right there. All right, so here we look at, somebody ho holler it out so I can find it here. Uh, ooh, it's way at the bottom. All right. When the thousand years was over, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Very, this is all very Jewish. To gather them for battle. In number, they'll be like the sands of the seashore. They'll march across the breadth of the earth, surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but, <laughs> but, fire came down from heaven and devoured them all. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning fire, where the beast and the false prophet were also. And they will be tormented day and night forever. So I thought, when I first read it, I thought there were two battles. But as I studied, I started to realize that this could be talking about the same battle. But plunk in the middle of this is this passage of a thousand years. So how does that all, I mean, Paul, uh, John, what are you doing here? Why surround this with these battle things? Why? And again, if you're following the apocalyptic style of literature, he is revealing to us that the devil is defeated. He is bound. He is bound. Now, how did I get this? All right. Let's look at this. This is really interesting. I think it helps to lay over top of it the book of Mark. Okay. So in the chapters of Mark, chapters one through four, we're not gonna read them all, we don't have time today, but I would encourage you to do it. So Jesus, he is, like Mark just jumps in, like he's one of those immediate guys, right? That's how the style is written. So he jumps in with Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. So that there's a clash, there's a battle. All right, there's a battle that takes place. And Jesus comes out of this battle, and what is the first thing he does? He preaches that the good news of the gospel is here. Repent and believe. And that word gospel is, it means good news, but it is a political word. It was borrowed from the culture. 
It's a political word, and what does it mean? It specifically pictured a messenger coming into a town, riding on a horse with the news of victory over an enemy, and how that news will have immediate effect on that town. That's what that means. That's what the gospel is. So Jesus comes out of the desert, having defeated Satan, and then he walks up and he says, good news, there's been a battle, and I'm the winner. And everybody's kind of going, what? What's this guy on about? And then to prove it, one of the first things that happens, chapter one, that evening after sunset, the people brought Jesus, all the sick and demon possessed. Why? Because one of the first things that takes place after Jesus gets out of that wilderness with the devil is a victory over Satan. A demon is cast out. And he won't let it speak. Don't you say anything. Isn't that interesting? So he starts in on this, and then by the time we get to verse 32, by that time, the whole town, verse 33, gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who were various diseases, and he drove out many demons. And he wouldn't let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Later in Mark chapter three, we read this. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell anybody who he was. So it sounds like wherever Jesus went, if somebody had a demonic problem, they just fell down before his feet and started saying, you're the son of God. And he was like, no, 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 okay, fine. But don't say anything. All right, then Jesus teaches his first parable in the book of Mark. It's found in Mark chapter three. The teachers of the law were concerned that Jesus was casting out demons because he himself was the prince of demons. That's how he was doing this. That's how they theologically wrestled it to the ground. But this is what he says. Jesus called them over and he he spoke to them in a parable. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself, he is divided, he cannot stand, his end has already come. And then he throws this beautiful tidbit out. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first binds the strong man, same word as what's in the book of Revelation, and then you can plunder his house. Interesting. So if I'm understanding this right, and if I line up these scriptures, I'm seeing what's happening during this millennial time is basically picturing all that Jesus accomplished already. It's already happening. And so therefore, it is my own personal study and opinion, not yours perhaps, that this is the description of what's going on in the millennial time. It's happening now. It's not something that just happens later on. It's right now. We have been given authority. Look at what happens. So, okay, finally, in John chapter 12, this is what it says in John 12. Now is the time for judgment on this world. The prince of this world has been driven out. Really? Has he really been driven out? Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe him? Come on now. Some of you are wrestling. I see it. If he's driven out, then how come he's still around? How come he's still deceiving people? How can that happen? How can he be like a roaring lion seeking anyone to devour if he's been cast out? Well, that's a great mystery. Okay. Now, as we study this passage, in verses six to four to six, it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Who is this? Who are these people? Now, a lot of commentators were saying that these are the martyrs because of the next verse. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. So this is, a lot of people just read that and say, oh, these ones who are given authority is just those ones who are martyred. And they did not worship the beast or the image and have not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead 
did not come to life until after the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. This is the first resurrection. And lo and behold, if you read carefully, that's it. That's the resurrection. There really isn't a second. Oh, and this is the second resurrection. There really isn't that. But we'll keep going on this train of thought because it's really a blessing. I just found it so invigorating and strength bringing. Um, The second death has no power over them. They are priests of God and of Christ, and they reign with him in the thousand-year period. They come to life. They've been resurrected with Jesus' life, and they rule with authority. And this is why we have this ability to march under Jesus' authority into all the earth and make disciples of all nations, because the devil has been bound. That's why we are free to do this. Interesting. All right, so the question remained as I was looking through this. He still is deceiving. So how can this binding work? Well, I I read in one of the commentaries, this one was from uh, Daryl Johnson. He says that this picture is like a mob boss in jail. Okay, the mob boss is still running the outfit on the outside, but he himself is quarantined in jail. So the beast from the sea, politics, and the beast from the land, religion, the false prophet, they do his bidding. He gives them his authority, it says in in chapter 13. He gives them the authority. So they do his bidding. That's why there's still deception. That's why there's still hardship here on this earth. But in spite of that, we carry on presenting the gospel There are billions of people who've come into the kingdom since Jesus left this earth and promised to come back. And there is more to come. Our job is to keep on going. Let's fill the banquet hall of the wedding feast of the Lamb, shall we? Let's fill it. Fill it with the souls of everybody we come into contact, of everybody we send money to, of everyone, so that they can reach the maximum amount of people to stuff the banquet hall full of people. Because that's what the king wants, according to Jesus. The father wants the hall full. All right, so we go and we do this work. The work of the gospel work of reaching all the nations can begin when Jesus said it could because of his authority over the devil. He is restricted in his ability to deceive the nations. Remember, he's let go again. And then he goes out and deceives them with all the full fury that he has. And he seems to be able to draw another army. Or does he? He seems to be influencing an army anyway. And so that's why I think this battle that starts off the millennial passage is really the same battle as the one that's described after. The beast and the two, the two beasts and the dragon are thrown into the sulfur lake. And there they are tormented forever, along with those who worship them. Wow. This is our champion song. This is our champion song. Now, this thousand years. Okay, let's talk a little bit about it. Let's have a heart to heart about a thousand years, shall we? So there are three different approaches to this. And uh, probably you'll already know by how I've interpreted this passage where I stand, at least today anyway. Okay, I found, if you want to study this more, I found a great book, and this man uh, and his resources does a fantastic job of treating each of the, of the ways the millennium is understood very well, very fairly. So, the first way of understanding of three is the premillennial view. Now, maybe some of you here are like, yep, that's me, I'm premillennial. Awesome. Well done you, okay? If it indicates, as it indicates, the option is believed that Jesus returns prior to the thousand year reign, and all that happens during that thousand year reign is without the church there. We're gone, we're raptured. So this is the view that this premillennial stance takes. And I love, number one, one of the things I like about it, it's strong. It's strong in the Jewish people fitting into all of this. That's where I think it's, it's actually its greatest strength in my view. 
that the nation of Israel will be saved as Paul has been praying for in Romans 15. He wants the Jewish people to join in the party. And I think that part is right on the money from my perspective, all right? So straight, Satan is then stripped of his power. The saints are raised from the dead. Jesus sets up his kingdom on the earth with all the saints. They rule for a thousand years. Satan is released and then finally destroyed. And then everybody enters into eternal bliss, heaven, hallelujah, on earth. Okay, so that's premillennial. The strength, as I mentioned, it's good because I believe that they see how the Jewish people fit into this. And I think that's its greatest strength in my view. Uh, a second one is that they are eager to reach the world with the gospel before the rapture happens. So there's a little fire under their butts, right? But the problem is that I find its weakness is, is that there's an attitude of escapism. Let the world go to hell in the handbasket because I'm going to be out of here soon. And I think that's a great weakness of this teaching according to what I read, plus also what I believe. I should tell you that I have believed each of these at some portion in my spiritual journey. So, I don't know, maybe you call me a heretic, maybe, go ahead. <laughs> All right, all millennialism, a thousand years is understood as symbolic. So that kind of gives you away, I tip my hat. Okay, it's a thousand years is symbolic. It's the time between Jesus came first and when he comes again. He comes first as a lamb slain, and then he comes again in power as king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus begins his kingdom reign when he first comes. Satan is bound, not completely bound because he hasn't been thrown into the fiery lake yet, and he is defeated at the cross, uh, and he is released at the end for a short time, and then will be destroyed in the lake of fire, followed by eternal bliss, which is the same ending as the pre mills. All right. Post-millennials, oh, strength. Strength is, it's very mission-focused. I like that. We are on a mission here. We are on a mission to reach as many as we can through the Lamb's example. Loving sacrifice and witness. That's what we're all about. And the weakness I see is that there's laziness woven into it. And it's because it's happening so slow that our focus gets lost. And I think that's a serious problem with the all millennials. All right, the post-millennialisms. Jesus comes after the thousand years. During the thousand years, the gospel changes the world. I love that part about it, actually. The, the church ushers in the golden age where the world is wonderfully transformed and made ready for her king. I love that. It will be like the parable of the yeast in the dough. Jesus taught this kingdom will come, but not with a bang, slowly, quietly, and inevitably. Evil will push, or evil has the final push at the end and is destroyed, which is followed by eternal bliss. All three have the same ending, eternal bliss. The strength, well, the, this view is very gospel-centric. They're very strong in gospel and preaching the gospel and winning the lost. Um, but they also believe that the gospel is the only hope for politics, industry, and institutions. And so they go to work trying to change those as well. All right, so they want to have a Christian government so that when the king comes, it's already prepared for him. All he has to do is sit down on the throne. That's their goal. All right, I'm, I'm really simplifying things, but I, d I don't have time to break them all open. All right, so as I mentioned, the strength is this is very gospel-centric. The problem, the weakness is, it's very utopian in its mindset. And because of that, it can be consumed by the very politics it's trying to overcome. And so it gets a little messy in there. Okay, so that's its weakness. And I think also they have a very low view of the power and nature of sin. They think they can turn it over and bring in the king. All right, so that's, in my view, the weaknesses. All three positions have dedicated biblical scholars. I wish you could have been with me this week as I studied them all. I'd read one commentary, it would say pre-mill. I'd read the next one, ah, mill. I'd read the next one, post-mill. I'm like, these are all excellent scholars that I've been following this whole time, and now suddenly they're all divided. But each one said basically the same thing. 
So I wanna, I wanna focus on this now. What is it that each of them have in common? So each position has, all three believe the best is yet to come. Amen? All three believe that. All three believe that the future belongs to Jesus Christ. All right? All three believe the future is not in our hands because it comes through from the outside. The king is coming. Okay? All three believe the thousand years is real, but one takes it literally and the other symbolically. But they still believe it's real. And it all points to God's sovereignty. Why? Because it's time-framed. And only God can time frame things in his sovereignty. All is not as it seems. Don't just use these eyes. Use the eyes of faith. All agree that, the Jesus, that Jesus does not become king. He is already king. And he's coming to take what is rightfully his. So that all three are the same that way. And finally, of the options, they all agree that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ... Life, his death, his resurrection, changes everything. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, when the calendar flips over, you go all the way back, it's so important that even our calendar to this day is fixed around the birth of Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so Daryl Johnson writes this in his commentary. We must all agree to disagree agreeably. Say that with me. We must all agree to disagree agreeably. (laughs) Because there just isn't enough scripture to totally nail down one of these perspectives. You just can't. it's, It's apocalyptic. You can't just say this has to be the way it is. And if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. The birds are going to eat your flesh. You can't do that. Well, one thing is, we have to treat each other kindly in this because it's not, it's secondary doctrine. It's not, it's not Jesus is God and man doctrine. It's secondary. And it's taking, it can be taken several ways. So you can't nail it down. So let's be kind to each other. As I mentioned, I believed all three. And I hope I'm wrong about premillennial. I think I've said that before. Uh, I can't wait. If there's a rapture, I'm going to be dancing in the air. I just want to try that to see what it looks like, okay? If there's a rapture, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm not going to pout. The king has come. However, if it doesn't go that way, I would expect that all the free meals are not going to run around pouting either because they had to go through trials. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to be, I told you so. That's not me, and I'm not going to do that, Lord willing. Okay? Same with the post mills. The good news is that all Christians are going to enjoy fully everything that has been won for us by our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to enjoy it fully, however it takes place. Amen? Come on now, with me? Amen. This is going to happen. Now, this next part is tough because it's known as the great white throne. And let's finish with these thoughts. I saw a great white throne, and on him was seated, or, and he was seated upon it. So I'm thinking God here. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. Isn't that something? Earth and sky fleeing from his presence. How mighty. How powerful, how awe-inspiring. Nobody's going to run up to the throne and give the God of the universe a high five. Hey, good job, buddy. Not going to happen. He is just so amazing. So amazing is he that the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. God is, God is writing your story in a book. Okay, and these books were opened, um, which is called, another book was opened, which was called the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they'd done according to these books. The sea gave up the dead that were in them. The death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what they had done. 
and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, people of God and those in this room who do not yet believe, today is the day of salvation. Because someday you will stand before Almighty God and you will not be able to get your biggest smile to win him over. He will see right through you. And your name, he'll look. It's not here. Into the lake you go. You've made your choice. You've made your choice. Not him. You've made it. And so here he says, again, as you've been saying through the book of Revelation, Today is the day of salvation. If you're here in this room, it would be unkind of me not to give you the opportunity to pray and receive, maybe for the first time, the Lord Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his blood washing over your sins so that you can receive it and live forever with him and not have to worry about this day. (sighs) And we want to take as many of you as we can with us because we don't want you to have to worry about that day either. It will be a great and powerful day and a sad day and a tough day for those who do not believe. So get your name in that book. Ask God to to receive you. Ask him to take away your sin. Ask him to wash you with his blood and then write your name down in the book so that you don't have to miss eternal bliss and glory. That is the courtroom scene that is described in Isaiah chapter 11 and Daniel 7. All right, we're going to finish with this. Those of you who are believers, you and I are royal priesthoods. We're of the royal priesthood of God. Males, females, children who believe, all priests, royal priests. We have been given authority, and this authority is interesting. Yes, it has power. And in fact, one day, (laughs) the disciples came running up to Jesus. Oh, man, we spoke in your name, and the demons fled from us. And you know what Jesus said? Yeah, I saw Satan fall already. He's already fallen, folks. You don't have to worry about him. He's fallen. Take him seriously, for sure. But he's fallen. I saw heaven. He fell from him. He's gone. He's down. He's down, down, down. That's what he says. And then he says, listen, this is the weapons of your warfare, prayer. Pray for people. Never think your prayers are wasted. They are all powerful in the Lord. You may be praying for something and God will just take it and make it his own anyway, because he is the king after all. Right? Do you ever remember doing that with your dad? Dad, I want this. Dad, I want that. Yeah, sure, you can have this. No, 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 not that. And then later on you think, oh, thank you, Jesus, you didn't give, or thank you, Dad, Dad, you did not give me that. All right? It's very important for us to understand. Our prayers are important. But even more than that, he has filled us with his Holy Spirit. He, he says in Revelation 12, we overcome him who is the devil by the blood of Jesus. It's his victory, not ours. It's his, we walk in it. It's his word that we testify to, that we give witness to. It's his word in us that we testify about, that we give witness to. And then he says, take the spirit. Here's your weapon. So you ready? Love one another. Love your enemies and watch what happens. That's the weapon that he's given to us in the spirit. Peace. Be peaceable. When, peace, when people are unpeaceable, be peaceable. Grant peace. Be patient. Everybody goes, yep, that's, uh, that's not me. <laughs> No, be patient in the spirit. This is your weapon. Your patience will let them know the king is near, according to Philippians 4. Your kindness, be kind to one another. Be kind to those who are lost. Be kind. This is your weapon. This is sacrificial love and witness. Be good to others when they're not good to you. Be faithful no matter what. Be faithful. Not because you're so amazing, but because he is in you. This is your weapon. This is your weapon. Be faithful. When everybody else gives up on you or gives up on what's going on, not you. You be faithful. 
And then be gentle. Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is here. That's how they'll know he's here. By your gentleness. These folks are our weapons. Let's learn how to be good with them. Let's learn how to fight hard with these weapons. And yes, we do have the weapon of authority over the enemy in Christ. We have that authority too, and we can use it when it's needed. Why? To defeat his work. Or as we heard this morning, to shut the door on him. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever had the door shut on your face, but it's not a pleasant thing. And I can't wait to do that several times this week because I don't like Satan. I'm going to shut the door on him. In your face. Because the king is with me. The king is with us. The lamb has won. Hallelujah. Sacrificial love wins. Hallelujah. And we must witness to this even if it costs us everything we have. Hallelujah. Finally, be sure, reminder again, be sure that your name is written in the book of life. Please be sure. Take that serious. Because you will not be able to change your minds once you're standing before him. That's it. The judgment has come. Wow. I apologize in advance if your cake is a little soggy today. (laughs) We've gone to quarter to 12. And I knew this would be a long message just because there's a lot there. But I didn't feel like I could break it up. I'm sorry. It had to come as a package. And so uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. I'll do my best to answer, especially about the millennium stuff. I got great resources. I can give you those too. Uh, Be encouraged, folks. When we die, that's when we live, and that's when we win, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for your faithful word, and thank you for being faithful to us in your word. We ask for the Spirit of God now to do his work in our lives based on what we've heard today, whether it's salvation, whether it's repentance, whether it's a new spring in our step, because we win in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, stand with us because we're going to... uh...